make sure it's working. My name is David Lawrence, and we're at the Atlanta History Center <clears throat> on August the 15th, 2005. We have us with us today as our guest, Mr. Carl Gems, spelled G-E-M-E-S, who's a native of Bartow County, Georgia, was in Georgia Tech, uh, joined the Navy, couldn't quite pass all the physical exams and got drummed out of the Navy Corps and got redrafted into the Army and spent a lot of time in training during the early part of the war years and then in the Battle of the Bulge, 1944-45, and has spent the remainder of his life in Atlanta. And Carl, we're delighted to have you with us today. I want you to tell us what it was like growing up in Bartow County during the Depression, coming down to Atlanta, what your feelings were before the war started, Pearl Harbor Day, and what happened to you after that. Well, thank you. To begin with, uh, I was uh, born in Bartow County, a uh, little town of uh, Kingston, Georgia. I uh, went to school, school there. My family left uh, part of Bartow County that was near U Harley, Georgia. And my uh, grammar school years were been at the uh, U Harley uh, Grammar School, and my uh, my family moved to uh, Rome, Georgia, when I was uh, maybe in about the fourth or fifth grade, and I uh, lived there. My father was a farmer all of his uh, life; had a farm in in uh, Bartow County area and a, a successful uh, a farmer there. I had, uh, was from a large family. I had uh, three sisters and three brothers uh, and um, I had a stepsister later so we had a large family, seven people. I. Uh, Finished uh, when we moved. We moved to Atlanta, Georgia, when I was uh, in about the uh, ninth grade, and uh, went to school at the best junior high school. Started uh, started uh, there, then uh, graduated uh, from old commercial high school in uh, uh, 1930, 1933. Went to work for a manufacturing jeweler and engraver. Set in the high schools and uh, colleges, class range diplomas, and that uh, that uh, sort of thing. Then about uh, about that uh, time, uh, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened, and I was, of course, really. Kind of alarmed about uh, that, not knowing what was uh, going to happen to our country or how it would affect me and uh, uh, my brothers and sisters and so forth. So uh, I had, uh, in the meantime, had some uh, classes at uh, Georgia Tech and later the uh, Georgia Evening College. While I was at Georgia Tech, I uh, enlisted in the Naval Reserve, the yeah, Naval, Naval Reserve program. Qualified to uh, go to school at uh, Naval Academy at Annapolis. I finished the, it was a three, three months uh, course, which was really the first uh, course after the, uh, after uh, about the time that Pearl Harbor happened. The requirements were pretty strict uh, naval medical requirements and after my schooling there at the Naval Academy I, uh, I could not uh, get commissioned because my eyesight wouldn't come up to their standards so I took a medical discharge from the Navy, returned to my home in Atlanta and uh, registered for the uh, draft and was uh, drafted uh, in 
November 1941. Went to, uh, to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina for basic training. Qualified there to go to officer candidate school in the field artillery. And uh, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and was eventually finished there and commissioned in the, uh, in the uh, Army as a uh, second lieutenant. Uh, I was real disappointed uh, at the time I didn't make the uh, medical requirements to be in the, be in the Navy, but the Army service was just as and maybe more rewarding than it would have been in the would have been in the in the Navy, and particularly when I know that the, the ship I had served on for about three months so, uh, was sunk in Solomon later, so I guess it's fortunate that I wasn't wasn't uh, on it at that at that uh, time. What ship was that? And the USS Quincy. Okay. It was a uh, uh, cruiser no. in the in the Navy, uh, and uh, <clears throat> after graduating from uh, in the field artillery uh, school, I was uh, commissioned and assigned to. Uh, the 800 Sunker Field Artillery Battalion, which at that time were acting as school troops uh, for the infantry school at Fort Benning, uh, Georgia. And uh, I was, I was uh, started out as the motor officer there, which was in charge of the vehicles that each uh, battery had. I was assigned to B battery as as a in the motor battalion part of it. Then later I was made executive officer where I was in charge of the training of the uh, and how to fire the one oh five millimeter howitzers and uh, the outfit that I was in had been just recently switched from uh, 75 millimeter, how millimeter howitzers to the 105 howitzers, so it was the area of training, of training uh, there. Uh, stayed in Fort Benning, Georgia for approximately two years in this uh, job as, uh, as school troops. And then we were relieved from that and went on from there to uh, Fort McClellan. Alabama, and ultimately to uh, uh, Tennessee on uh, maneuvers. We were in the maneuver area for the three months, worst months of the year, December, January, and February, and uh, that was living on the outside uh, and uh, simulated battles that we in Tennessee, and turned it was but turned out it was it was rougher than the actual war war duty I think in those maneuvers, and uh, we uh, when the maneuvers were over we uh, went uh, back to Fort Worth, Alabama, and then from there to uh, to uh, Camp Gordon in Augusta, and then we. Uh, we uh, went on uh, from there to uh, overseas, and uh, we won the went over on the SS Columbia, which had been converted from a French luxury liner to uh, to a troop carrier, and took our our crossing of the Atlantic was approximately 11 days, and we, uh, we arrived in, uh, in uh, I guess the first or fourth uh, in Scotland, Scotland area, 
on a sunshiny morning. It was it was bright, bright sun, and everything was so green. It was glad to everybody was glad to be off the water after that 11-day trip across the Atlantic. We trained there and in the various uh, missions, getting ready for going across the channel. And we uh, were in an area where we didn't have much uh, much nighttime. The sun didn't go down till maybe 11 to 12 o'clock at night. And then the sunrise would be two or three in the morning. Our commanding officer said we'd be working from sun up to sunset, which was pretty long days uh, there. It was very interesting uh, uh, training. We got a little time off to visit the neighborhoods and that uh, that sort of that sort of thing, uh, and uh, got to meet English people. That time, uh, we, I wasn't married, so we got to date some of the English girls. They were they were pretty pretty nice to us, knew everything for for us that they could. They would like to entertain, feed you in their homes and that sort of thing. So it was it was very interesting. Ultimately, we uh, we. Uh, Finished our training and went uh, to the uh, area where we were to go across the channel. And uh, it was about the early part of August 1944 when we went across the, uh, across the water there. One of the things that uh, was kind of unusual the beachhead that was already established, uh, but it wasn't so far that all the dead bodies had been removed from the area, and I guess the American troops or uh, fun-like people and way in every, I'd never seen telephone booths in the United States so like they have in Europe. Uh, all the horse came after the war, like when we had booths sitting on the side of the road, but in France they were all very numerous, and every booth that I came to had a, a German soldier who was already dead, seated in the, in the telephone booth with the receiver propped up against the air <laughs> like he's making a phone call. <laughs> I thought that was right, right comical. Also, when we went, before we went over, across the uh, channel, we were told that the uh, French money that would that we might find around wouldn't be worth any anything to us. So we were issued what they call script script money, which is little green squares that were supposed to represent uh, European dollars or something that we were issued for for incidentals that we might uh, might want and said the French the French large French bills that you see said they won't be worth anything so don't pay any attention to to those. But the first time the first payday that we had uh, after we got in France we were issued these big French French bills that were we told it wouldn't be worth it today. We'd been, we'd been, when we'd been running across them, we'd, we'd shell bikes or, that had uh, money vaults and so forth and a lot of paper money flying around. <laughs> Everybody was picking at it and using to light their cigarettes and cigars with or <laughs> make bonfires out of it. Then we got paid with that same script <laughs> when, when we had payday, so. All they, they had a limit on how much money a soldier could send home. We couldn't send home more than he drew across the pay, pay, pay table. So a lot of them tried to convert the French money to dollars to send, send back home, but it didn't, 
But it didn't work very well since you couldn't send very much. Most of them making $21 a month, I guess, or something like that. So it, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, much there. But uh, they were, we were in, we were in a good many battles uh, in, uh, in France. The, uh, we were, at one time, um, uh, in an area where the weather had, the weather in the winter of 1944 was, was real bad. It was rain and mud and ice and that sort of thing. So we got bogged down in an area in France around Nancy, France, which is in uh, Western France and maybe 50 miles from the channel, I guess. And we were we were there for almost uh, almost a month, and uh, because we couldn't couldn't move, the or we used two and a half ton trucks to pull our howitzers with, and uh, with the mud uh, the mud and rain now uh, it was. Very difficult to move. Sometimes we'd have to have uh, all the trucks had winches on them, and sometimes we'd still have to have uh, tractors with long tow chains right. to pull out of that, pull out of the mud. But the weather did uh, clear up eventually, and it was it was uh, after having had a week or ten days or more of uh, rain and clouds and everything now. One morning, woke up in bright sun when the sunshine was coming, and American uh, fighter planes were thick in the air. First time they'd been able to fly much uh, for maybe a two to three week period, and it was a real, real pleasant sight to hear those planes flying overhead. So we got got moving from uh, from there. And uh, from that, from that part, uh, from that part uh, on, uh, we uh, we uh, made good, made good uh, progress. We were in the eventually worked out in southern France in the Colmar uh, section of uh, of France, and. Uh, Then we heard of the big breakthrough of the Germans in what came to be known as the Bulls, and so we moved from uh, the area where we were. We'd even been in southern, in southern France in, uh, uh, in summer, summer uniforms, khakis. We got to the word of the breakthrough in uh, the Belgium area, and. Uh, so we made a overnight, overnight run from where we were. Turned out about two days to get to that area, and then uh, and we, in the meantime, we were we were issued wool wool clothing, which we changed into as soon as we uh, built wet for for the night on that first day. Then on. Christmas Eve, 1944, we uh, we have arrived, uh, bedded down in the area, and the next morning when we woke up, now there were there was snow all over the all over the ground. They also we hit a trucks that hit a saw where they'll bump in the road and wonder if you'd hit a log or something. It turned out they were dead soldiers, both German and American, in many areas still covered, frozen, covered in, uh, covered in uh, snow. But uh, eventually we uh, were successful in having to eliminate the, eliminate the bulls, then we went back uh, 
to be gone. South of Solomon, across the uh, Rhine River, uh, and on into Germany. Meantime, the, the uh, war was going to, going pretty well in favor of the Allies all this time. So we all got up uh, in our battalion. There were 31 officers in the battalion. And so each one of the officers got up a little, one of the officers got up a little pool to guess when the war would end. Each one put in, put in $10 and uh, picked the day that the, that the war would end. Uh, each one had to pick a day since there was 31 days in, in May, we had 31 officers, each one had to pick one of those 31 days. <laughs> and the, uh, the day that uh, ended, it had to be the day where we were, not in another time zone or something. <laughs> so I happened to pick May 9th, and that was the day that it ended in our area, so I won the three hundred dollar, three hundred dollar pot, <laughs> uh, which was uh, after the, and our outfit wound up, wound up in in the area of Leipzig, Germany, which was in East Germany, and uh, uh, we held that area until the Germans, until the Russians came in, because they took over. They took over the area where 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 we were. At that time, we all had points, getting up to enough to maybe get us back home. They were released us on a on a point system. And I think the number of points that you had to have to get to get uh, uh, transferred back back to the states was maybe ninety. 90 points. I think I wound up with 94 points, so I was one of the first in our outfit, I guess, to uh, be assigned to an outfit that was on its way home. We came back, uh, we were, went to the, to the port in Marse Marseille, uh, France, and uh, this was in December, about the, I guess about the 20th of December, or maybe a little earlier than that, maybe it was about the 15th of, uh, of uh, December uh, of, of, it would be uh, 45, 1945, and uh, assigned to, to another field artillery battalion to bring a group of men back and we left on the, on the USS Tusculum. It took about, took about 10 days I guess to uh, get back uh, to the uh, north of Virginia area. And then from there, I was uh, sent to uh, Camp Gordon in Augusta. And it just happened to be released on the morning of December 24th, 1945. I got back home that, uh, from Augusta that uh, day. So uh, Two or three of us released at the same time they lived in the area of Rome, Georgia. They were coming through Atlanta, so they dropped me by my own point that had a car and we uh, went on. Uh, I got back uh, got back home about 10, or 10 o'clock in the evening on December 24th and my family was real happy to see me of course. In the meantime my, my father had died uh, in uh, November and I didn't know about it until I got back because we were 
moving around so that the word uh, mail had caught up with us so it didn't have uh, had heard it uh, by letter now by that time so of course that was a sad situation to uh, to come back to he was only he was only 69 at the time and he died so that was so Sad thing to get back. After getting back, uh, back home, uh, I went to work with uh, a London finance company, automobile finance, and uh, the company was uh, called Equitable Credit Corporation. It's out of a, a company that was headquartered in Washington D.C. Had several offices in. Uh, in Georgia, and uh, I went to work uh, for a company, uh, for that company, in the loan and finance business, and then uh, of course got married. I've uh, been writing letters to my prospective wife, who was living as a board at my mother's home at the time uh, I was in. Uh, of service, so we got married on April 6, 1945, which just happened to be Army Day, supposed to be in a parade that, <laughs> that day, but they excused me since I was getting, uh, getting married. I actually got released from the service in uh, March 21, uh, 19, 1946 which uh, I was actually on leave between December 45 and March uh, 40, 46. And uh, after getting married, uh, my wife and I, uh, I was transferred by the company I was with to Savannah, Georgia. We moved to my wife and I went to Savannah, Georgia, and stayed there three years, and came back, uh, came back home to, uh, came back to Atlanta. After that, we enjoyed Savannah, but at that time, uh, neither one of us had any relatives or any special friends in Savannah, so it was kind of lonesome for my wife, particularly uh, uh, during that uh, during that time. So we uh, we go to Savannah, I think, in January '47, and uh, came back uh, came back to Atlanta, and uh, from there in uh, 1950, and uh, I had. Uh, Continued in uh, that line of work for uh, loan and finance business for quite a while, and then uh, later uh, I got an opportunity to go to work for in the credit department or Mesa's department store, which was known as Davison's here in Atlanta at that time. I worked there about uh, ten years, and uh, then went to work for. Emory Schwalz Law Firm, doing administrative work with, with them. They were, they did a lot of collection work for uh, loan and finance companies and banks. And uh, so that was very similar to what I was doing at, uh, at Mesa's. So it worked out very well. I worked for Emory Schwalz for about 10 years, retired in 1984. And then went to work for Consumer Credit Counseling Service, uh, counseling people that were in debt, trying to show them how to get their affairs straightened out and out of debt. And I was there for uh, about uh, 10 years and retired. And from there, I guess it's 19, maybe 1994, 95. And, uh, 
have enjoyed retirement since uh, since that uh, that time. I feel that I've had a very interesting career. And they're going up for it, and the war and everything. We've had the outfit that I was in, the 802nd Field Artillery, started having reunions. Uh, I think maybe the first one was uh, maybe in 1986. So from my, about 1986 through 1997, we had uh, reunions once a year, usually in the uh, fall or spring of each uh, each year, and had them in various places, so, like in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a long time, I reckon. You're doing it pretty well. It's just 30 minutes. That's just half of it, Carl. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, I had, uh, Retired in around 1994 for good, I guess. And uh, since that time, I've enjoyed uh, enjoyed life. We kind of had a maybe a right interesting uh, life. Meantime, we'd had uh, we had two children. My daughter was born in 1953, and uh, she's. Married in 1975, has a grown son who's about 22 now, and I had a, my son uh, lives in uh, New York, Bronxville, New York. He's in the interior decorating business, uh, has a, his own old business in uh, Bronxville. He's been very successful at it. He has two little girls. Uh, um, not a little anymore, I guess maybe at 10 and, 10 and 12, uh, along in that area. And it's, uh, they're a little far away, but we get to see them maybe once or twice a year. So all in all, it's been a right, right pleasant living. What we're living now is a retirement community, and we like it very, very much. Uh, People are all friendly. It's the same neighborhood where we uh, where we lived for forty five years uh, after the after the war. So I guess that battle winds it up. Unless you have some specific questions. Carl, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I might. <clears throat> I want you to compare where you spent Christmas in December of nineteen forty four to where you spent it nineteen forty five. <laughs> I want to ask you, you've got two children. Your mother sent off three sons into the military. Right. All three came back? All, all, three, all three came back, yes. Uh, was, was there much emotion on her part, or did she just feel it was a commitment well, to duty? My, uh, my birth mother died when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. My father remarried. Oh. Uh, or maybe a couple of years after she died, and then that wife died about a year after they were married. Then he married for the third time. Uh, and uh, so I had a stepmother from, from I guess I was about seven at the time that he married the uh, third time. And uh, she, uh, so she was now, she, at the time my father married her, she had one one daughter mm -hmm. that uh, was maybe a, a teenager yeah. herself at the time they uh, they married, and we all all of us loved her as much as we loved each other, and uh, we had, so she wasn't she wasn't our real mother, but she was very almost almost the same. Well, I was only five, and I had a younger sister that was only a year old at the time that she came on the scene. So, so she was almost like a real mother to us. Do you remember your feelings on Christmas Day, 1944? 
do I really? I really do. We, we had gotten into the area where we were about midnight, I guess, and bedded down. And wasn't snowing at the time, but when we woke up on uh, early morning, make sure it's all uh, Christmas Day, uh, actually, uh, uh, there was snow all over the ground. There were lumps in the ground that turned out to be dead bodies uh, there, so, and the, uh, we could hear the, hear the garden, the guns already firing in the distance, and we were finding positions for our own guns uh, at that time, so it was, it was rather, rather awesome type of thing. And of course, then, then a year later, when I got home, on December 24th, uh, 1945, now, it was complete, complete difference from what it had been a year, a year earlier. Did you sing Christmas carols in 1944? <laughs> I don't think we even, I don't think we did much, did much singing. It was kind of, kind of bleak. And I think, of course, Christmas, that Christmas day we, uh, we ate out of our biscuits, <laughs> yeah. too, but uh, it was, we could still be, be thankful that we were still alive at that time. What was your first feeling when you first got fired upon? Oh, uh, well it was, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to believe, really, of course, when the, when we, uh, one, one little thing I left, left out was when we went across the channel. In the battalion that I was in, there were, there were five, uh, five batteries, three firing batteries, a service battery and a headquarters battery. Well, all of the, uh, all of the battalion, except the battery that I commanded, which was C battery, got on a victory ship to go across the channel. And they had to be loaded, and the guns loaded uh, <coughs> on that ship by, uh, by cranes. Mm -hmm. I went over the C battery, which is about 100 men plus our equipment, went over on a LST, which is a landing ship tank, with the front end of it folded down when you got to the beach and you just drove off. So, so my battery got up across the channel before the rest of my group. So I had to lead the whole LST group, which had other uh, division or other companies on it besides field artillery, I had to lead them into a bivouac area and we drove and drove and drove in, in uh, uh, blackout. Finally, finally I got out of that, saw my Jeep, got out, of course everything was lined up behind me. And I saw a light over in the distance and I trooped over there to it and, and uh, knocked on this door and then opened the door and looked in. There were the four Frenchmen sitting at the table playing cards and drinking. <laughs> and I had a time using my high school friends to try to find out where I was and they knew where this bivouac area was. But but eventually we, we got it. A couple of days later the rest of our group got with us and that and that was that was it. We traveled uh, in that area about uh, over 3,000 miles in France and Germany and the moves that we made. We fired thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition and uh, uh, we, only had, uh, we only had six men in our outfit killed. Was that right? During that. During all the fighting, 
we had we had about three that died in accidents, mm -hmm. but uh, only six that were actually killed in uh, in uh, the shooting. So you were behind the front lines far enough to where? Oh, uh, yes, we were. Of course, the infantry was in front, and right. we were we were behind the infantry. Infantry. Usually, we would be from three to ten miles right. behind the infantry. Right. So. So we didn't have the kind of casualties that, a, that an infantry outfit would have. What was your reaction to seeing the carnage, the bodies that you described frozen in the snow? And it was just, it was just awesome. You just were thankful that you weren't one of them. That was it. Yeah. That was uh, that was the feeling. It was it was really, really gruesome in some ways, particularly. Uh, in the cold weather and the freezing weather, of course you didn't get any sleep from it because they were frozen. But in the in the warm weather, it was the smell was awful from bodies and war and the smoke and the smoke and gunpowder and all that stuff. Did you see any concentration camps or prisoner of war camps? Our outfit. Uh, we were attached to outfits that did uh, go into into some of the concentration uh, uh, camps, but I I didn't personally see mm -hmm. see any. I didn't know. When you heard about them, what was your reaction? Just couldn't believe. It was just unbelievable that that sort of thing could happen. If you wanted to. You wanted to hate uh, all the Germans for it, but the German populace, they were really, really very nice after, uh, during the war when we were, had positions uh, in Germany and now they were, they were very, very friendly and very anxious to to uh, make you comfortable and feel good about things. When December the 7th occurred in 1941, it kind of unified the country. And on 9-11, a few years ago, we were attacked once again, yeah. more so than on December the 7th. And the country's not quite as unified today as it seemed to be no, after December the 7th. I guess so. Uh, Greatest generation type of thing uh, we felt back then, and we don't feel that same way now, I guess. No. I think one of the reasons people don't feel quite the same is because of the carnage from World War II is so vivid in everybody's mind that I think everybody would like to see anything done that's possible to avoid seeing that on a worldwide basis yeah, again. Yeah, I think so. Have you got anything else you'd like to tell us for your children or grandchildren? Any words of wisdom? Well, we just like to uh, say that uh, I feel fortunate to have had the experiences that I've had and lucky too to have had them and I, I hope that we never have to have another war here on our in our lifetime that we've had uh, had previously and that the present thing will get cleared up so we can all live peacefully. Well I would like to express my appreciation to you on behalf of my generation and my children's generation for what you and your generation did for us. You made it possible for me to get a, grow up in a free country and I'll be forever in your debt. Well, I guess we're all very, very, very fortunate. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for 